Howdy. It's good to see everybody here tonight. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We're very, very glad you're here. Thanks for being with us. Um, to the elders, thank you for this opportunity. I always count it a great joy to be able to stand up and present something of God's Word to each and every one of you. It really increases my faith and it really helps me to dig deep and study. Uh, I have some gentlemen that are passing out a sheet of paper to everybody. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. They uh, kind of didn't know they were volunteering, but they were kind enough to accept and, and, and go with it anyway. What I'm presenting tonight is on the heart. And I'm handing this sheet out as only a tool that hopefully you can take some notes on and maybe you can even uh, present this information to somebody at work or present this information to a family member or uh, friends. I've actually used this at work. I've presented it to several people and it was very well received because most people would agree that to become a Christian, you have to have a change of heart. But what does that mean? Does the Bible call the heart the heart and we call it something different? You know, we have a tendency to break things down. When we go back to Genesis and God created male and female and they were to reproduce after their own kind, God simply calls animals different kinds. But we have a tendency to break it down into species and subspecies and sub-subspecies and mutations within those species. That's what we have a tendency to do. And the same is true about the heart. We do the exact same thing. Now, when we're talking about changing the heart, we're not talking about this lump of flesh that's right here in our chest. Someone comes forward and Mr. Goff takes him back behind this wall and he lays him out on the table and zippers him open, takes out the old heart, puts a new heart in, zippers him back up, right? No, that's not what we're talking about. I've been behind this wall and I can assure you that we do not have the facilities to facilitate such an operation. So what we're talking about tonight is the seat of man. A lot of people believe that it's just the emotional side of things. Emotions do play a part in that, but it's not the whole heart. So what does the Bible call the heart? The first thing the Bible calls it the heart, but man, we would call it our intellect. That reasoning, thinking portion of ourselves. What do we think and reason with? Matthew 9, 4 says this. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? So the heart actually thinks. Hmm. How about Mark 2, 8? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? So your heart thinks, and it can also reason. Consider Matthew 13, 15. For the heart of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Hmm. And then finally consider Romans 10, 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So already on this very first one we see that a heart is a thinking, reasoning, it understands and it also believes in something. Now tonight, this is not going to be the end-all, be-all of all heart studies. We don't have time to go through all that tonight. Time won't allow. I could preach till midnight on the heart, and we still wouldn't get through everything the Bible had to say on the heart. What I'm hoping this is, is a review for all of us, or for most of us, and maybe even for those of us who have never done a study into the heart, a jumping-off point to do a more exhaustive study in the heart, to understand what it means to change our heart. And the first thing we'll have, we have to change to change our heart is the intellect. Secondly, the heart is the part of man called emotions. Emotions. Now this is where our society usually thinks of the heart. When we say the heart, they're usually thinking strictly on the emotional side of things. 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that deal only in the emotional part of their heart. They let it make all the decisions, their emotions. I was just talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago. He said that he was saved. I said, oh, that's fantastic. I said, that's great. I said, how? What did you do to become saved? He says, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, no, you had to do something to become one of the saved, so how did you do that? What did you do? What was the process you followed? He says, well, I, I don't know what you want me to say. I, I don't understand. I know I'm saved because I feel it in my heart. Oh. You know, I've been to several uh, places where they have a guy, a preacher, stand up, and he goes, don't you feel saved, brother? And I'm like, no. No, no, I actually, I don't feel saved. I mean, salvation isn't really a, a feeling. It's more of a state of being, is it not? I mean, I'm happy. I have joy. Uh, I don't have a guilty conscience, you know, because I haven't done anything to transgress God's uh, laws or commandments right now. So I'm in pretty good shape. But what does salvation feel like? And so many people out there base their salvation, their eternal soul on what they feel. Now, we, uh, we found out a couple of quarters ago when we read uh, Muscle and Shovel that feelings are inherently inaccurate in certain cases. So we've got to be careful when only dealing with feelings. There's another side of this, uh, relationships. Mr. Goff just did a, a talk about the husband's responsibility in the marriage. And he said, you're going to do the wife study. Is that next week? Fantastic. <laughs> Why is everybody laughing at that? I'm being serious. I didn't plan this, by the way. It just happens. Uh, but so many in our society go up and they go, well, I love them, but I'm not in love with them. And I think, well, what a really stupid statement. You know what they're really telling you? They're trying to tell you that they're trying to make themselves feel better about not wanting to be with you anymore. Has anybody ever had that happen to them? Oh, good, I'm the only one. <laughs> it really was me. It wasn't them. Uh, so, if you're a boyfriend and girlfriend, it's not a big deal. My, my granddad used to tell me, they're like streetcars. There'll be another one along in a minute. And he's a little bit different duck and not very sympathetic to my plights. But uh, you get the point. But too often we see marriages where people are saying that. And that's a real tragedy. So what does the Bible say about the heart when it comes to emotions? Let's deal with 2 Samuel 6.16. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. The heart can despise now, our society tells us that hate is a terrible emotion. You're not supposed to despise anything. But despising something can be, even though it's a negative emotion, can be a very positive thing. Not that you despise an individual, but if they're doing something that's wrong and you despise what they're doing. If you despise sin or hate sin, but was David's wife doing the proper despising here? No. No, it wasn't. No, she wasn't. Consider Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Your heart can desire. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So your heart can love. How about Proverbs 3, 5? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Your heart can trust. All of those things, despise, desire, love, trust. That's all what we would classify as emotions. And the Bible clearly says that it's just the heart. The heart is the part of the man called will. Will. Our actions, how we act, what we do. First Corinthians 7, 37. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, 
and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin as well. Your heart can determine. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The thoughts of the heart. Again, we have another verse here to prove that the heart is a thinking thing. And it also intends things. That's all a part of what we would call your will. Acts eleven twenty three. When he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them. All that the that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. You can purpose in your heart, and that's what we would call will. How about Romans six seventeen? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you <laughs> obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Which, was, which, which you were delivered. And so the heart can obey. Finally on your sheet, don't get excited, we're only about half done. <laughs> Finally on your sheet, the heart is the part of the man called the conscience. The conscience. Consider 1 John 3, 21. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Again, in verse 21, it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Our heart condemns us based on what we do. Our heart condemns us based on what we do, and that makes up the conscience. Now, Mr. Brad Harris said something very interesting in one of his talks one time. He said that hurting people hurt people. Those people that are hurting inside lash out and strike out at people. Why? Why do, why do hurting people do that? Think in your mind of an individual that does that. Then think of the opposite, that individual that always has an encouraging word, that always seems bubbly, that always seems happy, that always seems, no matter what's going on in their life, they're always encouraging you to be better and, and helping you out whenever you need it. What's the difference? The one who's lashing out feels guilty. They don't have a clear conscience. And because they don't have a clear conscience, it forces them to not like themselves, which forces them to act out and hurt people. The person who is always an encouragement, always a help, who, who always does everything for you, and he's always, you always look forward to seeing them because they always just pick your day up, they make your day. You know what they, they have, what their conscience is? They don't have a guilty conscience. Now, you'll be able to see that they get tired sometimes. You can see the stress weighing on them, but they don't have a guilty conscience because their sins were forgiven. They don't have a guilty conscience because they know what they're doing, they're acting properly. And even when they do sin occasionally, they go before the Father, they get forgiveness of that sin immediately, and then their conscience is clean again, and then they're happy. And they don't lash out at people. So, so what? What's, what's the payoff here? What's the application? This is what the Bible says the heart is, but I haven't told you how we change it. What's the interrelationship of it? If you want to change your heart, the first thing you must change is your stinking thinking. I believe Mr. Goff has said that on more than one occasion from this pulpit. Your intellect changes based on evidence that you present to it. How you think about something or someone will determine how you feel about that something or someone. How you feel about them will determine how you act towards that something or someone. And then based on your actions, that will determine whether your conscience is clear or not. 
Consider Saul. When Saul started his trip to Damascus, did he have a clear conscience? Sure. Sure, he was going to persecute the Lord's church, but his evidence that he had presented to his intellect told him that that was the right thing to do. He thought he was doing God's work. And that negative thinking towards the Lord's church led him to have a negative emotions towards the Lord's church. And those negative emotions caused him to act negatively towards the Lord's church. But he thought he was doing the right thing, so hey, his conscience was clean. His conscience was clear. But on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him. And Jesus appeared to him and gave him some of the evidence. Did he not? You know what I think is interesting about that, that, that story is, Jesus appears to him. Jesus could have told him exactly what he needed to do to have forgiveness of sins, right? Jesus could have told him that. He's the one that set it up. He's the one that established the way that it was going to be presented to everybody else. But I find it interesting because Jesus didn't step on the authority of the disciples, that authority that he gave them to preach the gospel to people. He didn't step on that authority. I think that's interesting. Anyway, uh, so Jesus presented some of the evidence. He goes to Damascus, and Ananias comes to him and presents the rest of the evidence. And based on that evidence, it caused Paul, to, or Saul at the time, to make a decision. Is what I'm hearing true or is it not? If it's true, then he'll start thinking positively towards the Lord's church, and that's what he did which caused him to feel positively towards the Lord's church, which caused him to act positively to the Lord's church, and now his conscience is yet clean again. Yeah, he feels bad for what he did in the past, but he knows that he has been forgiven of all of those things, and he doesn't feel bad about it anymore. His conscience is clean. He can go on. We had a, a gospel preacher here just a few uh, gospel meetings ago, he said something very interesting, and, and maybe some of you remember. He, he said that occasionally what happens is, is when, he's, when he's done preaching, someone in his congregation will come up and go, Brother, I conquered a secret sin. Does anybody remember him saying that? Oh, good. Just me again. Fantastic. No. But he said that. You'll have to take my word for it and then go back and listen to the, to the tapes later. But my question was, How? How do we conquer a secret sin? You know, we as Christians do a fantastic job of saying what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Sometimes we are a little light on or fail to tell people how to do it. When I'm struggling with something, I'll tell you that a lot of people quote scripture to me and they'll say something like, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Okay. But that still doesn't tell me how to deal with what I'm dealing with. It doesn't tell me how to conquer that sin. Yes, that's true, but is Christ in me enough or not? It becomes a Christian, almost kind of like a Christian platitude. Yes, it's true because it's scripture, but it's not very helpful when you're going through something. Or they'll say something like, well, he will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear. He'll make a way of escape. And they pat you on the back and they walk off. Again, not very helpful. It doesn't tell me how to find that way of escape. What do I have to do? How do I conquer that secret sin? Ladies and gentlemen, I present a way. You start by changing your stinking thinking. You start by presenting yourself with all of the scriptural evidence and everything that God says about that sin, whatever it is. Now, if it's a... If it has physical manifestations, you can even go outside of God's word and look at all the negative physical things that could happen to you if you do that. Let's say you uh, talk about drinking, right? The Bible says be sober-minded. It says not to be uh, 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 carousers or revelers or social drinking and stuff like that. But then you can go outside of that and go, you know what? If I drink and drive and I get caught, I could lose $10,000, lose my license. Uh, I could hit somebody. I could kill them. All of that becomes evidence that will help to change how you think about whatever sin that is. And once you change how you think about that, that drives your emotions. 
If you think negatively towards it, you're going to feel negatively towards it. And that feeling is going to drive your actions, your will. You're going to start acting negatively towards that sin. And then, based on your actions of a negative nature towards that sin, your conscience is clear. But sometimes we're weak. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes what we know to be true and what we actually act like is two different things. And so our conscience feels guilty because we know what we're doing is wrong. That guilt or that innocence that we feel in our conscience actually is evidence that we can present to ourselves as well. Yes, I'm doing the right thing or no, I am not doing. And over time, as you commit yourself to doing that, when you fail, you go back to God's word, you look at all the evidence again, you re-steal yourself. And then eventually your heart is completely changed. Now, it sounds easy. It, 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 the, the formula for it is very, very easy, but the actual application can be, can be quite difficult. But don't give up. We can't afford to. But that's how you can change your heart towards sin. <laughs> what about relationships? Somebody I mentioned before, somebody tells you, well, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Not too bad if it's a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. That's okay. They don't want to be with you, fine. Go find somebody else. But what if it's your spouse saying that to you? The advice we give them is, we'll fall back in love with, with your spouse. Okay, how? How do we do that? When we fell in love with our spouse to begin with, we might have been so wrapped up in the emotional side of things that we really didn't pay a whole lot of attention on how we fell in love with them. So what do we do? We change our stinking thinking. The first thing you need to do is go to God's Word. And look at your responsibility. If you're a husband, you look at what God expects you to do in the relationship. You look what God expects you to, uh, uh, to do to your children. What he expects you to, how he expects you to love your wife. How he expects you to behave. You take care of you. If you're a, a husband, don't worry about the wife's part. You worry about what God told you to do. Right? Right? And as you do that, start looking for ways to quantify your love. Not that you can boast, but that you can lay in bed at night and go, you know what? I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did... Well, I did three things right. This one I need to work on tomorrow. I loved her properly in these three things, but this one needs a little work. I can do that tomorrow. Start bringing her flowers or doing work around the house that she doesn't like to do. Whatever you can do, when you're, when you're in such a desperate situation where those feelings are gone completely, you grab onto anything you can. And that thing that's positive becomes evidence. You start thinking of them in a positive way. You don't concentrate on the negatives. Oh, they did this. No, don't worry about that. Present to yourself positive, reinforceable things. And when you do that, that will change how you feel towards them. If you think negatively towards your spouse, you're going to feel negatively towards them. If you think positively towards them, you will feel positively towards them. And so when you feel positively towards them, that will cause you to act positively in a positive way towards them. And as you do that, your conscience is clear because you already have the evidence that it's based on, and so you know that you're doing the right thing. And when you fail, you re-steal yourself. You go back, you apologize, you uh, pray for forgiveness, and then you redo the process all over again. And as time goes on, and the more successes that you have, and the less guilt you feel in your conscience, that becomes evidence to yourself, which means that you think even more positively about your spouse, which means you feel even more positively about them, and then you act even more positively about them, and then you feel your conscience even, is even cleaner about them. It's like a vicious cycle in reverse. And you know what else, you know what else can happen? When you do that and you act like that, your spouse is getting different evidence about you. 
And so now the evidence that's being presented to her or him, that evidence they have to start thinking about. And they might start thinking about you in a positive way, which will change how they feel about you. They'll start feeling more positive to you. And if they feel more positive to you, they start acting more positive to you, then their conscience is clean. And so they're not hurting anymore. And so they're not trying to hurt you. And then that becomes evidence for you to present to your intellect, which gives you even more evidence. And it's just a vicious circle in reverse. Instead of spiraling down, you actually spiral up. That's how you fall back in love with your wife or your husband. That's how you do it. You change what you think. And it all goes back to God's word. Well, that's the lesson tonight. That's how we change our heart. That's the importance of it. When we become a Christian, we have to change every element of our heart. And, and to understand what each element is to properly change it. Now, what if your marriage is going great? Sure. Sure. Maintain it. Watch out for your heart. Make sure that whatever changes once can change back. Make sure it doesn't change back. Make sure you're always thinking those positive thoughts, scriptural thoughts, doing those things that will help you think properly. And by doing that, that changes your emotions. And by changing your emotions, that changes how you act. And then that will lead to a clear conscience. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Also, Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It all goes back to the heart. Tonight we offer an invitation. If you haven't ever changed your heart, you didn't understand how to change your heart, hopefully this lesson will help you. Hopefully you can start to change your heart. But if there's some way that we can help you, hearing, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's evidence, folks. That's the first step. Presenting yourself with scriptural evidence to change your intellect. Once your intellect changes, your emotions will change. Once your emotions change, then your actions will change. And if you're to that point, and you're ready to come forward and make the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, we can take care of that tonight. We'd be overjoyed, overjoyed to do that. And then your conscience will be clean, and it will be clear. For those of us who have had our heart changed, we are a Christian we do serve God. You know how to get Jesus into your heart? Study his word. Study his word. Because all of that becomes evidence. If we stay firmly grounded in his word, we will always feel properly about certain situations, whatever they may be. Whether they be, should be positively felt about or negatively felt about. And then we will act accordingly. Sometimes we'll fail, but then we need to go back. And we can go back before our Father and before Jesus Christ and tell Him, I've sinned. He's sympathetic. If we are faithful, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're here tonight and there's something that we can do to help you with that, please come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement.